So it's it's wonderful to to be with you here today, and we've got just a, a quick summation of where we're at. We've covered chapter one chapter of the book, one of of the book of Revelation. We've covered chapter cap chapters two and three, which were the addresses to the seven churches. And about a week and a half ago, we we spent a bit of time. We spent a week and a half just just trying to get through some discussion around the context and the, the first century setting of the book of Revelation to try to ascertain when about in the first century this apocalypse has happened and when it's taken place. Uh, so we looked at that last week and a bit the week before. So this week we're going to look at chapters, uh, chapter four, and then next week we should get to chapter five before we break for a couple of weeks for Easter. Now, when we left off, having completed chapters two and three, the letters to the seven churches, you will remember that the final church which is addressed is the church in Laodicea. And the address to that church ends with these words in chapter three. It ends with these words. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. So it ended up with those words. So by drawing reference to the throne of Christ and drawing reference to the, the throne of God, we see that now chapters four and five are going to pick up on what is the throne of God. So John in chapter four will be transported and he'll be given a vision of the throne room of God in chapter four so that it picks up the narrative from where chapter three left off. And we know that when we come down, when we come to the, the back end of this apocalypse in chapters 21 and, tw and 22, John is going to have the great vision of the temple of God, the throne of God coming down, the new heavens and the new earth coming down, and God's dwelling will now be amongst, amongst humanity with the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. So what John sees in chapters four and five, God's throne room, his, his heavenly dwelling, he sees at the end of the apocalypse now coming down. So we see that chapters four and five are really critical to the movement of the narrative because chapters four and five will be the throne room of God. And then the in-between chapters of Revelation, when we get to basically chapters uh, six and beyond to the back end is really about describing now the process that is going to take place so that God's dwelling can be can manifest on earth. Does that make sense to everyone? Where where the where the sort of structure or the movement of the po of the apocalypse is going? Does that make sense to everyone? Any, any questions on that particular point? Because it's an important point. Okay, so this week and next week, as I said, we'll look at chapters four and five. Hopefully, we'll get through them. Uh, in time for the Easter break. But with that being said, could I ask somebody to please read for us chapter four? Um, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby. A rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumbles, and pearls of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around. 
even under its wings. Day and night were never, day and night they were never, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They say, they lay their crowns before the throne and say, You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Thank you so much, Adrian. So what we have now in chapter four is something so exciting. It is a beautiful, incredible, awe-inspiring vision, an amazing moment when it comes to the announcement of the victory of God. As I mentioned, we have in chapter, th chapter 3, the concluding thoughts of the address to the seven churches is that the one who is victorious will sit on my throne just as I sat on the throne and I was victorious. So now we are taken into the throne room of God and we, are sweet, we, we get a wonderful glimpse of the victory which awaits us. And I want to just encourage you here today that Revelation chapter 4 just needs to be celebrated. Don't worry as much about understanding it. Just celebrate and revel in the wonderful, amazing future which awaits for us as God's people, for the victorious ones. So let's go on a journey now into the throne room of God. Now, one thing which is really, really important to understand here, we must remind ourselves that the book of Revelation draws a lot of images <clears throat> and a lot of connection to the scriptures which have come beforehand. So much of the imagery and much of the illusions in, in Revelation chapter 4 are to a couple of key texts in the Old Testament. In particular, uh, Ezekiel chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 6, littered, littered literally throughout this section, Revelation chapter 4, are illusions to these particular chapters. John's audience would have gotten the connections immediately, right away. As an example, in Ezekiel chapter 1, the prophet Ezekiel is commissioned. He is called to be God's minister, to be God's prophet. The people of God throughout the calling of Ezekiel in the aftermath have been exiled from the promised land. After centuries of rebellion against God, the temple, the earthly temple, which is what? The earthly temple, the temple is a caricature of, of the heavenly temple. So where God's dwelling is, the temple on earth is but an image, a miniature, if you will, of the great temple that is in heaven. That's how ancient people understood temples. A temple was where the deity dwelt as a symbol or a mirror of the greater heavenly realms where the, the, the deity dwelt. So Mount, so for instance, in 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 the, the language, the religion of, of the Greeks, which had the, the Olympian deities, the Olympian deities dwelt where? On Mount Olympus. So their temples were but mirror images where the deity takes up residence, the temple of Zeus, for instance, Zeus and his image takes up residency in there. But these are the false gods. So the temple of the true God, which was in Jerusalem, the people are ex exiled and the spirit of the Lord departs from the temple and the temple is destroyed. And here is the prophet Ezekiel by the rivers of Babylon where the people of God are weeping. And what does the prophet Ezekiel see in chapter one? He sees a vision, a remarkable vision of the throne room of God. And just like the kings of Babylon, the kings of Persia would have like a mobile throne, you know, when they went out to battle, they would have like a mobile throne on wheels. He sees a vision of God's throne on wheels, and he's given a powerful demonstration that the one who sits on his throne has actually followed his people into exile. 
So he has not abandoned his people. And Ezekiel then has this beautiful vision that one day God's spirit is going to come back and dwell in his temple. And what happens to Isaiah 6? Isaiah 6, Isaiah is ministering. The prophet is ministering in the temple of the Lord. And he has the vision of God seated on the throne. At a critical juncture of human history, when after a king who had lived for so long and reigned for so long over the nation of Israel dies, Isaiah is reminded of just who the true and the almighty God is and his throne and what it encompasses. So Revelation 4, where the people of God know that hardship and oppression is coming upon them at the hands of an evil empire, they are being reminded of the powerful truth that God's temple is now with his people, that God's spirit is now with his people. And where God's spirit is, there is the temple of God. And where now is the spirit of God? Well, the spirit of God is upon the body of believers as we now are the new temple being made into Christ. So Revelation 4 borrows much of these illusions. Now, One thing that is helpful helpful for us to remind ourselves on is a reminder that the the genre of literature that we are encountering in the book of Revelation is apocalyptic literature. So John is receiving visions. And what is a vision? A vision is a window into a greater reality. The reality is not the vision. The vision is just a snapshot. You know, in like a movie where they give you the trailer, A vision is like a snapshot, a trailer of the great reality that is to come. So as majestic as Revelation chapter 4 is, it is just a drop in the ocean. It only gives a drop in terms of how wonderful and how majestic the true reality is that we will experience one day. As Paul says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard what the Lord has for his faithful ones. So as much as we might celebrate the beauty of Revelation chapter 4 as we encounter the throne room of Christ, just remember that the apocalyptic nature reminds us that these are visions. These are powerful visions with a lot of symbolism, and they just communicate a drop in the ocean of what actually is to come. There is no way that a human being this side of eternity can fully capture the grandeur and the majesty which is God and to be in the presence of the Lord. So what happens to John? He's given an opportunity just to glimpse at a little bit of the majesty of God, and it's beautiful in what he describes. Does this make sense to everybody? Are there any questions that we have before moving on? Okay, so we move into chapter 1, verse 1. After this I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven, and the voice I had heard, I first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, and we are, we are told that these, this is the voice of Christ in chapter 1. Come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. So again, much of the image here that we are, much of the imagery that we are experiencing here comes from sections of the Old Testament. So if we were to read Ezekiel chapter 1, if we were to read Isaiah chapter 6, as we will be drawing on sections of this throughout, uh, we'll see that some of this image is picked up here. Can I ask somebody please just to turn here, and if you have the physical Bible with you, it might be helpful if you navigate through this stuff quickly with me. But somebody turn to Ezekiel, uh, Exodus chapter 24, verses uh, 9 to 11. Could I ask one person to turn there? And could I ask somebody else to turn to 1 Kings 22 19? Everyone can see my, my screen, correct? Uh, and if somebody could just read uh, Exodus 24 9 to 11 and if somebody else after that could read out uh, 1 Kings 22 19. I've got Exodus. Ah uh, yeah thanks Jill. So for Exodus 9 to 11. Ah uh, yeah 24 Moses 9 to 11. And Aaron. Yep Moses mm-hmm. and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. 
Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They okay, saw so that's God. Fine. That, that's, that's perfect, right? Yeah. So we can see here that we have a reference to a number of elders, and we have also reference to uh, lapis uh, lazuli. Uh, and we're going to see some of these points come back throughout Revelation chapter 4. Um, could somebody read for us the, the second Kings, the first Kings 22, 19 passage? Yeah, I can. Um, uh, Micah continued, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne with all the multitudes of heaven standing around him on his right and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab into attacking Ramoth Gilead? Oh, excellent. That's fine. You can stop right there. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, so as I mentioned, we've got to understand that this is vivid imagery. This is apocalyptic, vivid imagery. John, we, we're not to understand this. So people will have, have a misunderstanding here. They often, as we've said before, that in the past when people approach books like Revelation and they see the dramatic symbolism, their temptation is to try to draw connections to modern day life. That's not the point of this, this symbolism. This symbolism is just to give us a, an incredible, awe-inspiring understanding of the glory and majesty of God, trying to use as best human imagery. So as we see, God's glory is depicted like jasper, like a rainbow that shines like an emerald, jasper, emerald, rubies. All of these things are what? These are just marvelous jewels. And what is the author, what is Revelation trying to do in this visionary experience? It's trying to give us just a sense, just a little sample of the majesty of what God is like by drawing on images familiar to John's audience. What were the most beautiful jewels in John's days? Rubies, um, jasper, and the like. So, so emerald. So that is what Revelation 4 is trying to convey. So we shouldn't try and and we shouldn't try and uh, find ourselves in a position where we overcomplicate the symbolism in Revelation chapter 4. Are you with me? We're called to appreciate the majesty of God by drawing connection on what are some of the most beautiful images known to human beings. And even that doesn't do it justice. Does that make sense to everyone? We'll also see in Revelation chapter 4 that, that some of the imagery presented here in Revelation chapter 4, and I'll I'll point out where this converges at different parts of the narrative where relevant is that some of the images that are presented here draw upon the general understanding, the cosmology, I guess, ancient cosmology, ancient physics. So ancient cosmology and ancient physics is obviously very different to how our modern scientific revolution works, but it draws upon the generally accepted views about the world and the cosmos in throughout much of the ancient world. So just just a quick picture here on screen, just to try to just to try to depict for you, right? Um, some people have a concept, a misunderstanding. The ancient people believed that the Earth was flat. They did not believe that. That is an that is a modern misconception, a misreading of a very small segment of of the population. I believe during the Middle Ages. I could be wrong on that. Ancient people knew that the world was not flat. Um, you know, there were Greek philosophers who had used mathematical equations to demonstrate that. But the general understanding that they had was that the world was, the earth was almost like a disc shape with a sort of dome um, covering it. Now, this is actually, we think about this as unscientific. It actually is very, very scientific because what the science rely on, science relies on observation. So it was observation that was accurate to what they could observe based on the resources they had at their disposal. So their general understanding, and Genesis 1 picks up on this narrative, it's the idea that God has created the heavens and the earth and he's separated the two by this great expanse. And in the underworld is Sheol, the, the underworld, what is where, where the dead go, where the disembodied souls go. And on earth, we have a separation between the land and the waters. What do we have above? We've got, we've got the expanse or the dome above, which is like the dome of the sky, which, which we can see being spread out across the sky in sort of 
a, a spherical sort of dome-like fashion. And then what happens above that? We've got the, the clouds they believe were sort of keeping back the waters of the sky. And God and the, God, the cosmos is therefore above, the night sky is above. And then above the firmament is where God and the heavenly, where God dwells in the heavenly realms. So what is, for instance, the poetic language of, say, Psalm 139 say? It says, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I make my, my bed in the depths, what's the depths? Sure. So what is Revelation moving towards? The physics or the cosmology of the book of Revelation is moving towards this great and wonderful day where the two which were separated are now brought together and the realm of God comes down now to be amongst humanity. So it's this ancient, it's not just telling the victory of God, but it's telling the victory of God through the, the language of ancient cosmology and ancient physics. And it's just beautiful in what it conveys. So we are, we are called to appreciate this cosmology as we're taken up into the, the throne room of God, which in their mind, they can understand and appreciate the world around them. But what can't they understand? They can't understand the other side of the equation, which is the place where God dwells and where his temple is. And what John is given is just a mirror, a mirror into it. So we just quickly, so it says, after this, I looked. And this phrase, after this, we're going to see appears, pops up in Revelation repeatedly. And it's just a, it's just a transitionary device for us to know that Revelation is moving to a different scene. So the scenes that we have seen in the first few chapters are now, we're now taken into a different scene. And we've got to appreciate this. The voice that he hears is like a trumpet. I love this image, the image of the trumpet. What was the image of the trumpet? Well, in Exodus, um, uh, the, could somebody just quickly get that reference ready for us? Exodus 19, 16, ready for us. So where were, trump where were trumpets heard? Well, they were heard through processions. They were heard through military procession, processions or dignitary processions. When the king rides back into tr town on his chariots, the trumpeteer blows to announce the arrival of the king. And the voice of Christ is like a trumpet, which all people hear and take notice. And the voice of Christ commands authority that all people stop and take notice at what he's saying. But accompanying the sounds are what? They are dramatic images in nature. And you will recall if you were uh, at church on Sunday, I mentioned in the sermon that God's presence throughout the Bible, whether in the Old or New Testament, his presence is accompanied by a response in the very creative elements of nature that God's presence, even nature responds to his presence and his presence, which fills all of creation, is accompanied by powerful, dramatic signs in nature. In the book of Exodus, he leads his people by a pillar of fire. Ezekiel has his vision. He sees lightning echoing, emanating from the throne of Christ, of the throne of God. He sees he's caught up in the whirlwind. And these images convey the majesty and the glory of God. And could somebody just read for us Exodus 19, verse 16, please? On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning with, thick, with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Let me keep going. Oh, sorry. No, no. Thank you, Adrian. So we can see in Exodus 19, where are the people of God positioned? They're positioned at Mount Sinai. They've been, they've been delivered out of the bondage of slavery in Egypt, and they are going to begin their wilderness period, and God gives them the law. And he's given them the Ten Commandments. And they see physically, they see physical demonstrations of the holiness of God through the power, the smoke and the thunder and lightning and the, the trumpet which they hear, the booming voice of the Lord. And, and you can you can see that their response is through is to sort of is is that they're fearful of the holiness of God. So this is the imagery that John is conveying that he's taken up into the throne room of God. And the best way for him to explain the images that he is seeing is through references to the old Testament uh, narratives. I'll just pause. Are there any questions or comments here that people want to make? So it says that John is at once. I was in the spirit at once. I was in the spirit. What, 
what is the spirit's role? What does the spirit do? Well, the spirit in the Old Testament is very much associated and even in the New Testament with prophecy. So John being caught up in the spirit indicates that there is a prophetic revelation to what he is giving, what he's giving. But the spirit also does what? The spirit also convicts us of holiness and righteousness, as Jesus says in John's gospel. So John in the spirit is getting an appreciation of what? The glory and majesty of God, his holiness and his righteousness. The spirit is also what? The spirit also convicts us and leads us in true worship. Jesus says in John's gospel, when he's con conversing with the Samaritan woman, that God's followers must worship him, him in what? In spirit and in truth. So John being caught up in the spirit is a reminder that Revelation chapter 4 is primarily about what? It is about worship. That John is going to get a glimpse of what it means to worship God. What was it? What was the job? What was the job of the priest? Priest, the job of priests in the Old Testament were to administer the sacrament, was to administer the sacrificial system. And to do what? To lead people in worship. That's what their role was in the temple, to worship the Lord through the administer, administration of the sacrifices. Christ has done the sacrifices for us. So we now, as the priesthood of believers, the Bible says, 1 Peter makes very clear that you and I are priests in God's temple. And what is our job in God's temple? It is to worship God for all eternity. And Revelation 4 is an image of this wonderful eternal worship, which is to take place. But it begins with being led in the spirit. And that is where John finds himself. So open in heaven, that John sees heaven opened. This phrase open, this phrase of, of the, you know, the door open in heaven, it appears a number of times in the book of Revelation. And it's conveying the notion that John is being given a glimpse into the world, which was hidden from human eyes, into the world of heaven, into the greater reality, which is going to converge by the end of the narrative that, Heaven and earth converge and God's dwelling is now amongst humans. And John is given just an image, a window into this. And again, if we imagine ancient cosmology, if you if you imagine what in a in a poetic or a figurative sense, um, when the heaven, when the rain came down, it was almost like the heavens were being opened and clouds were being parted. Um, you know, Jesus at the baptism of Jesus, the clouds parted. It's almost like a window into a greater eternal reality and that's what john is getting but he's actually being transported into into the throne room of god so it says on the throne so scripture often personifies god's nature so just like earthly kings have courts just like earthly kings have thrones well they believe that this was a mirror image of what heaven was like so God, just like an earthly king has a throne, well, God must also have a throne. But what we see here, and there are parts of scripture which, which refer to the throne room of God in this metaphorical sense. We have uh, Isaiah chapter 6, um, verse 1, which, which, which says um, here that, you know, as it, um, the prophet says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated where? Seated on a throne. So if we... If we imagine that God is personified often in scripture as being seated on a throne. But what's remarkable about God's throne, unlike the human rulers, which they may have lavished throne, God's the, the things that lavish God's throne are the very jewels that he has created. So whereas, whereas kings of this earth may have jewel encrusted thrones and jewel encrusted thro uh, crowns, the God who created the universe is his temple. His throne is, is decorated by the great ornaments, which he has, which he has created and they shine to declare his glory. You know, jewels do what lavish jewels do what they reflect the sun, don't they? And they give off this beautiful wave, which emanates out of them. And this is the cosmic throne of God. And it's doing it on a great, on an even more grandiose scale here so this is the appreciation of the imagery that we are actually getting here in revelation uh, chapter one and think about these precious elements like jasper ruby and, and and the like these were all 
These were all precious, precious uh, emeralds, precious stones in the ancient world, and they appeared uh, in different settings uh, every, every now and again. Are there any questions or any comments that people want to make uh, at this particular point, or is it okay? So it says here, and this is a critical, critical point here that I, I want to emphasize. I've already touched on this. It says that the one who sat on the throne, his appearance, his appearance is like these things. His appearance is like these things. This is really um, important. The Greek word for appearance here, horasis, is the word that refers to a vision, not reality, not reality. It's a vision. When the disciples saw Jesus in the flesh, they didn't see a vision of Jesus post his resurrection. They saw him physically in the flesh. John is not physically seeing the Lord here. No human being can look on the eyes of the Lord. What does Isaiah say? Woe to me, I am, for I am a man of unclean lips. All right. Humans this side of heaven cannot see the image of God. We only see visions of God or just a taste of his majesty as was the case of Moses when Moses only got a glimpse of the Lord's glory. So it's clear that the images that we're seeing here is back to the point I was emphasizing before, that we have to understand that this is the world of of appearance, of vision, just a trailer into the glory of God. So as wonderfully majestic as it is to describe God's glory using these exquisite gems, it's even more important to understand that the real thing in reality, oh my goodness, it is going to be beyond words. It is going to be beyond words. Let's not even try to describe what the reality will be like. It's what I said before. Revelation chapter four is just to be appreciated. Just to be appreciated. If you and I think that the glory of God is wonderfully majestic, when we look up into the sky and we see galaxies, which are light years, not kilometers, not meters, light years. The speed of light travels seven times around the globe every second, light years away. If we think as majestic as all of those heaven of, of all of those bodies which orbit in the different galaxies are. If we think how majestic Mount Everest is or the creatures of the deep, right? Imagine how much more, if we as human beings can appreciate this, these things, imagine how much more the glory of God is. So much so that we human beings who can at least imagine what galaxies look like, if we can imagine at least what the, the great landscape of this planet is, that to, to simply experience God's glory. We can only be given a vision. That's how much greater God's majesty is, that his glory just emanates off his throne and all creation is filled with his glory. Yeah, that is what John is being given here. I don't want to underscore that point. And again, we have references to parts of, of the Old Testament. Uh, Ezekiel uh, cha Ezekiel chapter um, one, I'm just bringing it up here. Ezekiel chapter one, where he has that, that powerful vision of the glory of God in verse, in verse 28, it's, it says these, these uh, beautiful words here. Let me just bring it up here. Uh, verse 28, it says, like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance of him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God, the likeness. It, it isn't even his majesty. It is simply an appearance of his majesty. And it is being described in these wonderful, beautiful and, and powerful ways. But, but what I, I, I love about this is that even the, the glory of God, which we can only just get a glimpse of, he came down and became flesh. The one who is so glorious came down so that we could fully understand and appreciate him. What does 1 John 1 say? That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which our eyes have seen, which we have 
looked at and our hands have touched. This we proclaim concerning the word of life, that the glorious one who, who uh, it's, it's like the glory is like a rainbow, which, which, which magnifies emerald around his throne. He physically came down in a way that you and I could appreciate, right? How, how majestic is, is this? Do you remember at the start when I, when I, when I said, when I commented on the book of revelation and I said, how pathetic, how appalling is it that we God's people have ignored the victory of God as it is presented in revelation chapter four. If, 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 Romans is the theological gospel. Uh, Revelation is is the visionary gospel, the victorious gospel, which, which to the shame of followers of Jesus, we have ignored for so long simply because we have not wanted to actually appreciate the glory of God. Uh, are there any questions or any comments here? So we move on. It says surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones and seated on them were 24 elders they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their head now just just this is pretty easy to understand here right um and and part of the reason is let me see uh okay no that's right that's right um remember remember that chapter th chapter three has ended with christ's promise that the one who is victorious will get what they will sit on the throne also they will sit and be victorious so we're given an image of 24 elders who are sitting on thrones in victory in victory now the 24 elders uh, are symbolic so elders in in the old testament throughout scripture were symbolic of the people they represented the people so instead of all the people going and doing something before the lord an elder or an elected official would be the one who who represented god's people so for instance as as an example when the people of god in the book of exodus wanted to wanted to ratify the covenant of god they you know they're given the ten commandments and, and moses is going to be given the tablets and they're going to ratify that the people sort of elect uh, a number of officials to actually be their their representatives if if you would like so uh you know in um uh, i hope i put the the, the right um reference up there i'm oh, sorry it's, it's exodus 12 uh 21 uh i'll just read it for you here it says then moses so so basically this is uh it's not, not the ratification of the covenant that comes later on in exodus but this is at this particular point the people of god they they're about the exodus is about to happen and they're 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 sacrificing the passover lamb and everything like that and what does it say it says it, it says in exodus 12 that then moses summoned all the elders of israel and said to them Go at once and select the animals for your families uh, and slaughter the Passover lamb. So the 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 tw the elders there were representatives of the people. And as far as we can ascertain, because later on in the book of Revelation, we will this will make it really, really clear at the back end of the book of Revelation that these 24 elders are kind of symbolic. They're kind of symbolic of the old and the new testament coming together, the old and the new covenant coming together, that we have the 12 tribes of Israel and we have the 12 apostles. So the 12 tribes of Israel in the old Testament were to take God's message to be his representatives to the world. And the 12 apostles are the ones that Christ commissioned to take the gospel message to people of all nations. So we have 12 elders who are representative of God's people. And what do they sit on? They sit on thrones. So what we can believe here is that these elders are representatives of the great victory that you and I have awaiting for us, that throne in heaven, which we have waiting for us who are victorious. Does that make, does that make sense? So, so that is what John sees. He sees 24 elders symbolic of God's people who are going to be uh, victorious here. And what are the, what are these 24 elders doing? They're functioning as priests in God's temple. And later on, we see, what are they doing? They're worshipping. And this is symbolic of what we are going to be doing, worshipping God. They are dressed in white garments. We've spent a fair bit of time talking about white garments because they've cropped up elsewhere in, in the scriptures in Revelation, in chapters 
two and three. Just a quick reminder. So white garments, these were sort of garments which used were in a number of settings, you know, wedding garments, you would wrap the deceased in, in white garments. But more importantly, white garments were priestly garments. So what John is seeing is these elders dressed in priestly garments, that they are the priests serving in God's temple. And again, the connections we've already drawn upon is the reality that we are priests in God's temple, serving the Lord. Um, the crown, we've spent a fair bit of time. We've mentioned that a couple of times because it's also cropped up previously in Revelation chapter two, the, that, that reef, that Olympian, that Olympian reef, which is reef, which is wet, worn by victorious athletes. Well, golden crowns, golden reefs were worn by victorious athletes, specifically when the games were dedicated to the gods. Priests who also ministered before a deity often wore golden uh, golden reefs. I wish I had a, uh, I should have prepared this in advance. I should have gotten a, like, a, like a picture just to give you guys um, uh, like, like a bit of an, an example here of it but you guys know what i'm talking about you've seen sometimes in the olympics they might have those those uh those those wreaths those golden sort of uh wreaths that's what's being conveyed here so these 24 elders are representatives of the of god's people which which in court which it, it encompasses us which is just beautiful that one day we will be surrounded by the throne room of this majestic god worshiping for all eternity again any any questions or any comments okay from the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Again, I, I don't want to, uh, you know, labor the point here uh, as much. Exodus 19, when when God is, when, when, when Moses is up on Mount Sinai, the people see the rumblings, the flashes of lightning. Uh, Ezekiel chapter one, when he's caught up in the whirlwind, he sees the lightning. This is or what I was saying before, that nature responds and there are powerful signs in nature which demonstrate the presence of God on the scene. The book of Revelation says that heaven and earth flee from God's presence, that nature just responds to the command of the Lord who created it, which is just a, a marvelous, again, powerful descriptions. The seven lamps, we've referred to that already in the book of um, it, early, already in the book of Revelation. We remember the, the lampstands which are built, the, the menorahs in Exodus uh, 25. Moses is commanded to build the lampstands. You'll remember that from chapter one. We won't go through it. Just a reminder here that uh, the videos, the recordings, as I'm editing them, they're on that link which I sent you. You can access them and review them at any time. Uh, I'm publishing them on YouTube slow, uh, slowly so that people outside Parkside Thursdays can uh, review them week by week. Um, so some of this material we've already covered. This is just another reminder of this material. The seven spirits, we've referred to what they are. They're a reference to uh, Isaiah chapter 11. And this is all just poetic language which describes the, the Holy Spirit of God, which John is caught up in because God's presence is there. Uh, any questions or comments there? That should just be review. You can go back and review those videos. Uh, if, if you want more information. So we, we move on. So also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures and they were covered with eyes in front and in back. So yes, yes, it's, it's, it's lapis lazuli. Now, now this was a very sort of... Um, prestigious gem it was highly it was highly in demand in parts of antiquity and it's referred to in parts of scripture at different points so i, I mentioned that gems oft gems are often used for decorative purposes and to signify great wealth so, you know pharaohs had large treasuries of gems the high priest had different gems on his best on the breastplate to show to signify the different tribes of of israel so lapis or even like sapphires they're like that crystal blue that crystal blue that crystal sort of bluish um sort of scene and the language here reflects sections like uh exodus exodus 24 verses uh 9 to 10 i'll read that for you um as well so in the context of Exodus uh, chapter 24, uh, the people again are given just a glimpse of the glory of God. And it says, um, 
verses 9 to 10, it says uh, that Moses and Aaron, we already referred refer, refer to this for, uh, verse, Moses and Aaron, uh, Nadab and uh, Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel went up so onto the mountain and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis uh, lazuli, as bright as the blue, as, as bright blue as the sky. So again, if we imagine... If we imagine ancient cosmology, and remember I said that Revelation 4 draws on aspects of ancient cosmology here. If we think back to our, our image, then imagine the glass sky, the glass dome, this bluish sapphire lapis lazuli sort of image. And it's this, this, convey, uh, this image that conveys what do, what do beautiful gemstones do? They reflect. They reflect glory. And it's this, this this sense of what is going on here in Revelation chapter 4 is that the throne, the, sort of like the glass ceiling of God's throne room, sees and reflects down into the earth that God can see everything that's going on and, and what his glory bounces back like a great beautiful crystal crystal uh, emanates and reflects the sun that, that the, the throne room of God is constructed in such a way that reflects his glory to earth. And that is kind of what um, is, I guess it's kind of the sense of what John is visualizing here. Does that, does that make sense to everyone? Is that, have I explained that clearly, please um, pull me up if you think I haven't explained that, that clearly. Is, is, is it make, is it making sense? You, you imagine ancient cosmology, the way they viewed the cosmos, God's temple seated above, and you've got this, 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 this gem that the pavement is like lined with the gem, like the dome is lined and God's glory emanates and reflects the, the this great crystal like um, substance. Is that, is that making sense to everyone? Yeah, I, 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 that's clear. Uh, you know, it says here, the, the other image, which is probably being conveyed here in, in a sense as well is in Solomon's temple. Can everyone see that other image there? I wanted to fit both of these on the same page, but can you see the other image, which is kind of like a, a reconstruction of what the temple looked like. Um, in in Exodus, Moses is given detailed uh, detailed descriptions on how to construct the different furnishings in the temple, and then uh, in the tabernacle. And again, then in in one Kings, when it's describing the furnishing of the temple of God in one Kings seven, and also in Chronicles one, Chronicles eighteen. Um, the, because the temple, remember, is what? It's it's a miniature of God's temple in heaven. The furnishings reflect God's temple in heaven. God, that's, that's why God has to describe, not some human architect. That's why God has to describe what the temple needs to look like. Why? Because God is the one who's building the temple. You and I are not building the temple of God. We're not building people for eternity. The spirit of the Lord is building people for eternity. And the temple in the Old Testament was a mirror of that. Human architects weren't to design the temple. God was the architect who was going to tell them the dimensions of what the temple was going to look like, right? So the furnishings in the temple were described by God. Can you see in that picture? I'm so sorry if it's really small. Can you see that sort of bowl-like substance, the, the bowl there, that big sort of cauldron with the water inside it? Yes. Yeah. So the people of God were commanded as one of the furnishings to build like this, this furnishing, like this furnishing, this big cauldron with uh, underneath a sort of like um, uh, oxen or bulls. I can't remember exactly the details, but uh, the water, the clear as crystal water is clear. It's crystal, right? Um, the purpose of the water was for priests to ceremonially wash themselves as they ministered in the temple in a variety of ways, right? So it's kind of like this image that those who enter the throne room of God, the eternal dwelling of God, have to be washed clear. And what are we washed in? Well, we're washed in the blood of the lamb here. But Revelation, so Revelation 4 is drawing on some of these connections. Uh, making sense to anyone? Everyone, is there any questions or comments at this point? Okay, so just just quickly here, the the I guess the the description is also that the layout I guess is also significant. So it describes that the the, the throne is in the center, uh, God's throne is in the center, and you've got these other circles, uh, these other thrones which encircle it. So 
God's, God's heavenly courtroom, John's audience would have imagined earthly uh, king, court, king, the courts of earthly kings. But the Jewish Sanhedrin also sit, sat in a, in a sort of semicircular motion with the high priest in the middle. So I think John's audience would have picked up the connection that God is the high priest. Jesus is the high priest who sits on the throne. And we, the, the mini priests, I guess, in God's temple, sit around him just like the high priest would sit in the center of the Jewish Sanhedrin. Also, in, in Greco-Roman uh, choirs, they performed in such arrangements where you sort of had had the choir and you had the choir sort of surrounding them. And, and that's why if you look at um, the buildings like the amphitheaters in, in the ancient world, what are they built in? You've got the, the stage at the front and you've got like that semicircle around it. Um, and, and this is why is this important is because worship, the people worshiping the Lord are praising his name, singing praises to him. And it's that sort of Greco-Roman choir shape almost that's being mimicked there, as well as the Jewish Sanhedrin with the high priest in the middle. Um, so I, th I think that's, that's pretty self-explanatory. Okay. So we get on to the, we get on to the idea of, of the creatures in front of the throne. They're also in front of the throne was, what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures and, and they were covered with eyes in the front and in the back. The first living creature was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a face like a man. The fourth was like a flying eagle. Now, John's audience, uh, just, just a quick, this is, this, is, this is not the symbolism or the meaning of what this passage, what these four living creatures are, but I just thought I would um, put it out there just as a bit of trivia for you. You know, every now and again, particularly if you go into like Catholic churches, you might see uh, these symbolism, uh, the symbolism, you might see uh, a man, a lion, uh, an ox and an eagle. This was taken from parts of scripture like um, Revelation, like, um, you know, Ezekiel chapter one and Revelation chapter four, but in later Christian traditions, the man came to symbol John's uh, Matthew's gospel because Matthew describes God uh, very much, uh, very much uh, through the, through the lens of, of the humanity of, of Jesus, you know, God's human representative, the son of God, Mark, his gospel is described as the lion because um, Jesus is presented as the lion of Judah in Mark's gospel. Luke his gospel is presented as the ox because, you know, the ox is, 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 is a servant. Ox, oxes serve and they're also sacrificed in the temple. And, and Luke presents Jesus as a person that really serves humbly uh, in, in there. John is depicted as the eagle. I can't remember exactly why all of these, all of the symbolism is there, but in later Christian traditions, this is what the symbolism came to mean. I don't think that's what the original uh, image what, what I don't believe that's what the original creatures were supposed to symbolize here but it refers to them as living creatures the Greek word zoon is just one word we have to we have to translate it using two words living creatures and the reason for that is because there's no there's no one English word that conveys the sense of what this word means. So the translators have done their best to interpret them, to interpret it as living creatures. But the word really just means alive. Really what John sees is four living beings. He just sees four beings who are alive. We don't have two words in English to we don't have one word in English to convey this. That these beings that he that he sees emanate the glory of the life giving God. What does one chronicle? What does Chronicles one say? For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. So even the heavenly beings have been created by God just like the earth and the universe around us has been created. So what this, these living creatures symbolize is the life-giving nature of God. What John is seeing is he's zoom. He's seeing these living beings. They are alive. The glory of God has given them life. They are filled with the majesty of God because they have been given life. And the root word here, the root word here is the Greek word zoe. You know, in scripture, in John's gospel, when, when Jesus says that I have come that you may have life and life to the fullest, 
The Greek word he uses is zoe. You must have, I have come that you might have life, zoe, and zoe to the fullest. It means this fullness of life which emanates from the glory of God, which you and I will be filled with in our glory, glorified, resurrected body. These living creatures are zoe. They are filled with life, the life which is given by the glory of God simply in his presence. His glory emanates creation. That I don't think it, it doesn't take much. This is the remarkable nature of our God. He's not toiling away to put galaxies into orbit. He's not toiling away to put mountains. He's not toiling away. His glory is just so majestic that these things just happen by the, by the power of his word. So what John is seeing is living creatures who are alive with the glory of the Lord. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. So as we, as we try to imagine what these create creatures are, it's important to understand the framework of what John is seeing here, that the illusion of what John is seeing is very much to chapters, chapter six of Isaiah and chapter one of Ezekiel, where these things are referred to the four living creatures are referred to in those particular chapters. Now, what they were seeing can be helpfully understood by understanding a bit of art, actually a bit of art. And we at Parkside can actually appreciate this. You know, near our church, how we have that Nineveh um, function center, how they have those, those massive statues outside, yeah. right? This is kind of what Ezekiel and Isaiah, the best framework we can imagine for what they're actually seeing. You see, in, in, in ancient Mesopotamian artistic and religious expression, so in, you know, Sumeria, uh, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, where what prophets like uh, prophets like Ezekiel were being exposed to, they were being exposed to these cultures, you know. Uh, Daniel, Ezekiel, when they walked through the gates of, of places like Babylon, they would have seen these things. When, when God's people in, in, ex in Isaiah were being exiled to Assyria, they would have seen these hybrid creatures these hybrid creatures were like like larger than life depictions of animals and also divine beings I, I i suppose so what they see are kind of like these hybrid creatures they're like creatures which are half lions with the head of you know a human or with wings like eagles so they're seeing these hybrid creatures and 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 that's kind of the cultural milieu which should help us understand these prophetic and these apocalyptic visions that take place in like Isaiah 6 and Ezekiel 1 and Daniel chapter 7 and here in Revelation, that they're seeing these, these kind of hybrid creatures. And what is remarkable is that often, often these hybrid creatures were sort of deified in, in some parts of these ancient cultures. But what's, what's remarkable is that they're not God. Creation emanates from the glory of God. You know, the, the depiction of kings in the ancient world, if you look at pharaohs and the like with their great big statues to depict themselves as larger than life, the kings of Babylon and Assyria and Persia were depicted as these larger than life beings here, right? Daniel, when he's in the lion's den, in, in ancient Assyrian mythology, the kings, uh, kings would have these mock battles where they would slay lions to show their ferocity, to show their power. And it's God who is actually the one who has all dominion over the created world. So the reason why I think it's important for us to understand a little bit about the artistic and religious expression is that these were the images that, that the audience were seeing every single day. So John is, is getting, if he's getting a window into a greater reality, God is using images that he is familiar with. Um, uh, this is, well, what's interesting, it's really helpful for us is that John also painted a picture for us. And this is a picture of what he's seeing here. I'm, uh, I, I'm joking here. His, his vision corresponds in some ways to the visions, but they're also different in other ways. So in, for instance, in Ezekiel's vision, he sees these larger than life hybrid creatures with four faces. Each face, one was of, each one had the fate, had four faces, one of an eagle, one of a ox, one of a man and one of a lion. Whereas John sees the, the creatures separated here. Um, this image here is of the Lamassu. If you go to museums, you can see these sort of hybrid larger than life creatures and you can see their wings and everything like that. 
Now, I'm not saying um, you can see they've got the face of a man, but they've got like bodies which represent different things on the eagle's wings. I'm not saying this is exactly the thing that Ezekiel has seen or Isaiah sees when they see the four living creatures or exactly what John is seeing. But I'm just trying to give you an indication that the best possible way for us to visualize these things or to try to get an understanding of why they are seeing these things in this way are probably through the artistic and religious expressions that they were familiar with around them. Does that make sense? Are there any questions or comments anybody wants to put forward at this time? It makes sense what I'm, I'm saying right here, that it's a visionary experience which incorporates some of these particular things. Uh, uh, when there are no questions or comments, I assume that it's making sense to everyone that I'm being, I'm being pretty clear here. Okay, so we move on. Okay, so why, so why, so we see these four living creatures are referred to throughout the book of Revelation. So when we, when we come across these, these living creatures in other parts of the book of Revelation, I, I won't, I won't go back over it over and over again. I'll assume that we've done the work here to try to understand what John is actually seeing here, but they appear and they also found parallels are found in Isaiah chapter six and Ezekiel chapter one later today, or sometime read those chapters because they are, they're phenomenal. So, so scholars, scholars try to debate why these particular creatures, why a lion, why an eagle, why an ox, why um, why the man? Why these particular creatures? Uh, these particular, and to a certain extent, we don't know. The, uh, Revelation doesn't specify why these particular things are emphasized here. Why not other animals? You know, why isn't a tiger emphasized? Or why I don't know is 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 you know anything else? A fish emphasized or whatever it is, right? But there's probably reasons for that, which we've got to wait to the other side of heaven to fully understand and to fully unpack. Um, but these these animals were were biblical creatures so the lion conveyed dominion we have the lion of judah lions communi uh, communicated power and authority because lions have what lions have dominion god is described as the lion of judah the one who has dominion over over the over the earth uh, ox oxen were sacrificed in the temple as exodus 20 verse 24 tells us that they were part of some of the animals sacrificed in the temple so uh, oxen were all oxen also worked so you know maybe maybe the the example here is that the lion symbolized that we as god's people will rule one day with christ but as ox serve you know what do ox do ox ox are farming animals who serve maybe we as god's priests are also going to serve uh which is true eagle symbolized god's provision his refuge and his comfort when we read psalms or isaiah how many times are we told that you know god gathers his people under his wings as Isaiah, God's people will be comforted and they will soar on wings like eagles. The man conveyed a number of things, but the most basic image of the man in biblical theology was the, the man conveyed the image of God. So the sort of connection point that I'm making, I'm not saying that hundred percent that this is correct, but I think that those particular things are chosen because they have biblical imagery that we these creatures are doing what? They are serving and they are worshiping God. They're pre they're fulfilling the function of priests, which we will one day fulfill in God's kingdom. So, as God's priests, we are victorious. Like the lion, we have dominion. But like the ox, which which serves, we as God's priests will serve Him. We will forever be under the comfort of God's protection in heaven, and we are as His humans. We are created in His image. So, I think that these parallels probably all come together. I'm not saying that's 100% what these things are, but, um, you know, that's, 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 I guess, the sense of what is to come there. Yeah. yeah and, and that's why we don't have to try to invent connections for it. That's right. Just, let's just, how the earliest readers would have read it is how we should read it. And therefore, what do we see? They would have drawn these connections and they would have understood the apocalyptic literature, everything. Uh, any other, any other questions here? Okay, everyone has done really, really well. So uh, they have, they're covered with eyes all around them. And day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and who is to come. Now, the wings symbolize 
holiness here. And they're probably a reference. We can see that's an image of the Ark of the Covenant. So one of, remember I said the furnishings in the temple mirrored the greater temple, which was in heaven. And this Ark here, I know it looks, it's quite, have you ever seen an Ottoman? You know, Ottomans have that sort of rectangular shape and you put your foot on it. The Ark of the Covenant was actually in the shape of an ancient Ottoman. Kings would have a glorious footstool made of gold and lavishly built. So the Ark of the Covenant was built like, like Pharaoh's or uh, his footstool, which is why the Bible says that the earth is the Lord's footstool. It's, the Ark of the Covenant is not God's throne. It's his footstool. And the, the cherubim or the angels with their wings are prostrating before him. And the posts were just what they used to carry them on, right? But these living creatures have six wings, and what do the wings symbolize? The wings symbolize God's holiness. God's holiness. Because when you've got wings, you can cover that which is not holy. What was Moses commanded to do when he was encountered, when he encountered the burning bush? Take off your sandals for the place you are standing is holy ground. God's throne is holy ground. And when heaven and earth come together, Everywhere becomes holy ground by the end of the book of Revelation. So everywhere we tread is holy ground. And the wings symbolize the holiness of God and the presence of God, the holy ground around him. The eyes are everywhere. They're covered. They're seeing in all directions. These eyes symbolize God's omniscience, God's omniscience. And we see that communicated in places like Job 34, 21, Psalm 34, 15, Proverbs 15, 3. I'm not going to read those verses out to you. You can go and read them later. But the eyes of the Lord are everywhere. And these creatures embody God's omniscience, that that, that they embody the fact that God can, is, is all-powerful and all-knowing. Um, just quickly, I'm going to skip over the holy, 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 because I want to I want to come back to that and spend a few minutes closing on that particular point. Day and night... They're worshiping the Lord. So in Pergamum, we remember that Pergamum was one of the seven churches. They had a, an imperial choir set up in Pergamum with 26 members who sung hymns to glorify Caesar Augustus, who they had deified and made him into a god. So there are some a few shots fired here that God who sits on the, thru, the true throne of heaven has the eternal choir singing his praises. And the audience would have drawn that connection that it's not it's not Augustus and his imperial choir, which was set up by human hands, but it's God's eternal choir, which is singing the true praises of the true one and only God. Uh, whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, these verses, the one who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, these are descriptions for God. We see them littered throughout scripture. The 24 elders do what? They fall face down. Remember the 24 elders are a symbolism of who? The people of God. They fall face down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns. So they take off their, their, their priestly garments, their priestly crown, and say, you are worthy, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being. Domitian, so this is one of those debates as to when it was when the book of Revelation was written, but Domitian had set himself up as Lord and God, master and God, So the, the, and he wanted people to worship him as such, but the true God is the one who sits in heaven and people prostrate to him. People, when you prostrated with your face to the ground, you bowed down in reverence to either a king or a deity, Jesus receives this sort of reverence. When the wise, when the magi come to him, what do they do? They prostrate themselves. When the when the woman who's when the Canaanite woman whose whose daughter is demon possessed comes to Jesus, they fall and they prostrate and they worship him. When the when Jesus is raised from the dead and, and they're on the mountain before he ascends, his his disciples worship him. That all living creatures in heaven and earth are on holy ground. And they are worshiping the Lord. And this is what it means to be a priest in the temple of God, that it is to worship the Lord day and night. 
but I just want to close with, well, well, just before I close, does that make sense to everybody what, what's happening mm -hmm. here? That day and night eternally we're worshipping God. Any questions or comments? That what is worship about? What is Revelation chapter 4 about? Cosmic worship. The creatures which are alive are worshipping God as a cosmic orchestra declaring his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The Lord God Almighty. Three times it repeats the phrase, holy, holy, holy. This phraseology, holy, 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 appears only twice in scripture. Once here and once in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3. It has become known as the as the trice hagion trice meaning three hagion the greek word for holy is hagion trice hagion three times holy in jewish literature if you wanted to repeat something if you wanted to highlight something you would repeat it so you would say it once and you would say it again hear o israel the lord the lord the problem is, so the scriptures were, were essentially oral texts meant to be written, read aloud. The problem is in our English translations, if you were to read the Old Testament in Hebrew and to speak it orally, you would see these this liter literary device of things being repeated multiple times. Whereas in English, we have other ways we have other ways of emphasizing things. So maybe we'll write it in capital letters or we'll italicize it or we'll underline it or put it in bold. Whereas in the ancient world, they didn't do that. They just repeated it if they wanted to emphasize it. So the, the trace hagion doesn't just repeat holy. It doesn't just say holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. No, it does it three times. So if the greatest way to emphasize something is to repeat it twice, this is repeating it three times. To say what? To emphasize the holiness of God in a way which just doesn't want the audience to miss. Holy, holy, holy. The most frequent adjective to describe God in the Bible is God is holy. We tend to say God is love. We emphasize that in our culture. And absolutely, 100%. God is love. His nature is love. He's intrinsic. He intrinsically, he is love. But the world has a distorted view of God's love, of what true love is. Every description of God must be understood through the adjective of holiness. God's love is holy love. His righteousness is holy righteousness. His judgment is holy judgment which is why he is always correct. Everything about God is holy, which is why the, the, the trace hagion is so important that beings in heaven are repeating it day and night. They are never stopping to worship God. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. His holiness is what we are worshipping. And Revelation chapter 4 is, is presenting the beautiful throne room of God, which Revelation chapter 5 is going to continue in its survey of the throne room of God, such that when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we will see the throne room of God, the temple of the Lord in heaven, coming down, where for all eternity, you and I as priests in the temple of the Lord will repeat the trace hagion. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. In Revelation chapter 5, where we resume next week, we'll repeat how you and I become holy by the shedding of a lamb.